Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lady Scientist Podcast. I'm your host, Jocelyn Pearl, and we have another great interview in store for you guys today. I chat with Celine Hollywa. She's the CEO of a company called Loyal, and she's doing some groundbreaking work in the longevity space. I think you'll learn a lot from Celine's experiences today. Before we jump in, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Kendall Investor Relations. And if you've been enjoying our content so far, please click subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Celine Hollywood's background is in neuroscience and health economics. And while she was in graduate school, she cold emailed Laura Deming and ended up getting offered a job on the last day of your internship. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and having to kind of make this pivotal decision in your career as to whether you are going to move to Silicon Valley and take a leap of faith or return to graduate school. And she went on to um, navigate working in the Valley with Laura and is now the CEO of her own biotech startup, Loyal for Dogs. <laughs> yes. So welcome, welcome Celine to Lady Scientist Podcast. We're so excited to have you. Thanks, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more about that origin story and um, working with Laura and what it was like making that kind of decision? Yeah, um, where would it be helpful to start kind of at the point of being in grad school or? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so I'd started my PhD at Oxford. I was having a great time, had already like, written a paper, but I was really, the, the lab that I was working on, uh, I was looking at the health economics of gene therapies. So specifically how can very expensive preventive medicines um, be dealt with quote unquote in various healthcare systems, specifically the NHS, which is single payer um, versus US multi-payer. Um, and in that, the lab I was working in had developed and brought to phase two and built, uh, built this company, Nightstar Therapeutics, that then was acquired by uh, Biogen around a gene therapy that my professor at his laboratory had developed. And I was just getting more and more curious about the funding of translational medicine. Um, and obviously venture capitalists had invested in Nightstar Therapeutics. I wanted to understand that a little bit better. So I reached out to uh, Laura Deming Cold, uh, basically just asking if I could come like work with her for free for two weeks. Um, we did a couple of interviews, which uh, I'm impressed she invited me because I definitely performed terribly at them. <laughs> and she flew me out and I came and just spent two weeks in, in, in San Francisco and longevity fund is my first time being involved in VC at all. And on my last day, the kind of goodbye dinner, uh, Laura surprised me with an envelope that had a job offer in it. Uh, and uh, for something that I, I roast her a lot for now, she gave me three days to decide <laughs> if I wanted to stay in San Francisco, take the job or go um, and drop out of Oxford or go back to my grad school program. So the next day I flew back to Oxford, uh, sobbed in the economy bathroom almost the entire flight because Oxford had always been a dream come true, right? Like I grew up as a family that didn't uh, you no, know, isn't super wealthy. I, my mom and my parents were like really proud of me for going to this Ivy League uh, equivalent university. Uh, and I was proud of myself for being there, having kind of, you know, climbed up the ladder, so to speak. And also Oxford is just like a, a pretty good environment. Um, and I was doing a really good job at my PhD at that point. Um, but I decided that Basically, the thing that made my decision was that I was learning more working at Longevity Fund than I was learning in my PhD. Um, and that was basically the, the predominant variable. So I just, well, I did this thing where I tried to do both for a while, but long story short, I left the PhD, left it on the table. I was about six months away from being able to submit my thesis when I did that, actually. Wow And went and joined Laura. And I failed a lot in that first year at Longevity Fund. But I failed forward, if that made sense. And that felt really important at this stage of my career. And I've obviously never regretted that decision. I love that. Um, let's fast forward to, to Loyal. Can you walk us through the early days of this idea formation and how things kind of came together? Yeah, so I never ever thought I would start a company. This was really not something that was on my radar. Um, and I, I, you know, I never did a lemonade stand. I, looking back, I think there were some traits that I had that were entrepreneurial, but not in like the business sense, right? And I uh, would have been very happy to work underneath Laura for another decade 
if that was the best way to facilitate the aging field. Um, I started getting the idea for Loyal actually because I was frustrated by the companies that were pitching us that longevity fund. They all had a very similar narrative of, you know, we have this drug or this mechanism extends lifespan in mice, uh, but, you know, FDA is evil, quote unquote, uh, aging isn't a disease. So we're going to go and develop this drug for some random disease instead. And it just didn't make sense to me that nobody was developing a drug, an aging drug for aging, a lifespan extension drug for lifespan extension. And I really became obsessed with how could we, how could we do that? Um, and kind of among, along that path, I kind of came across the dog aging thesis and um, became really obsessed with it, but also thought it was completely ridiculous, right? Because in my, like the frameworks that I had, I've been in human biotech, I've been thinking about human drug development the entire time. I had no context for the dog market. I had no context for consumer companies. Um, dog, I was embarrassed to say the phrase dog lifespan extension for probably four months when I explained to people what I was working on. Really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Which sounds ridiculous now, but it just like, it gets a reaction from people. And when you're mostly around kind of traditional biotech, it doesn't necessarily get a positive reaction, right? But I don't know, the idea was just like an earworm. It was like, I, it's one cool thing about Loyal's idea has been like kind of viral. Um, and it was like viral internally too. But that's a bad metaphor, but it, it was really like, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of it, right? It was, yeah. um, I just kept on thinking about it. Um, and then, yeah, long story short, some people heard that I was working on this, um, uh, specifically Greg Rose in a box group. Uh, he basically over the period of like a few months would meet up with me, ask me how I was thinking, what I was thinking about, and um, give me real help, helpful advice, like tra practical advice. But I think more importantly, like helped me see a path where I could be a founder and helped me like understand that I uh, potentially could be a top tier founder, which again, I never patterned myself to being. And because I don't fit a lot of the patterns. Um, and yeah, he gave me a term sheet and I decided basically as I signed a term sheet that I was going to do this and which is also not a pattern match, but it was true. And I've, yeah, it's been the coolest, like I've now fallen in love with entrepreneurship and building companies and operations and uh, like people theory and all of these things that go into building a company that aren't just the science. Yeah. But I had no idea I would going forward or going in. And it's just been the, I've changed so much in the last two years. And I don't think I ever would have grown as much if I had not started this company. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so Loyal recently completed their first clinical study. Um, congrats on, on that big milestone. Can you tell Thank us you. a bit about how that study came together and what some of the learnings were? Yeah, so there's a couple of things going into that study. So it was just called the Healthspan study. Um, and we were uh, assessing about 500 dogs, large and small, old and young, cross-sectional, one data point for each dog or one um, like time point for each dog to do a correlation, comparative correlation of various aging markers and biomarkers. Um, so the goal was to support our FDA filings and get some data towards some of the mechanisms we're looking at. But there's also this meta goal, um, and I think I think it's been really important, which is de-risking the things that we can de-risk, right? So there is an existential risk whenever you do biology that just the science doesn't work and that you don't know and you can't know until you do it in some ways. But there's also like a ton of like ways to operationally fail um, or uh, induce a biological failure that would have been preventable if you had operated better as a company. And so something that was really important to me and really important to the company the way we work is that we didn't want our first ever clinical study to be um, to be the key one for market approval of our drug, right? That was too much risk to take on. And none of us had run a clinical study before uh, for dogs. So we kind of two for one decided to run this health span study, get this key data, um, but also learn what it takes to run a study and test some of our hypotheses specifically around the idea of consumer marketing a clinical trial. Um, and how to make a friendly clinical trial. Uh, and we had a lot of incorrect assumptions going in that we uh, were gonna do this pilot one more time now with a, the drug actually, um, because we realized how much we didn't know we didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it just closed out a couple of weeks ago and we should be getting the results basically as soon as our CRO send back the, the sample results and really excited to look through that data uh, and we will publish it uh, when the time comes. That's awesome. 
you, you mentioned something about a consumer facing study is that the term mm -hmm. you used yeah can you can you explain that a little bit more yeah so one of the meta theses of loyal is that um aging has a severe branding problem people tend to brand things around you know extreme lifespans and immortality and it shuts down the conversation because the majority of people are not interested or otherwise turned off by that and so one of the ideas of loyal is in addition to hopefully getting the first ever aging drug approved we also want to socialize and uh, make warm the thesis for the average individual. Um, the other half of it is that this idea, and that dogs are a great way to do it because it's non, uh, uh, what's the word? It's not a controversial idea to extend your dog's lifespan. There's no societal harm that would ever come from having dogs living longer, healthier lives. It probably would, you know, help with some of societal's issues right now, society's issues right now. Um, so that's one half. And the other half of the thesis is that there's an opportunity to build a consumer focused pharmaceutical company, a D2C pharma, I mean, so a pharma company that people don't hate, that is, has within their blood, this ability to be consumer first. Um, this doesn't mean that D2C and consumers really touch most industries. It hasn't really touched pharma yet, partially for structural reasons, and also just because the circles of competency really don't overlap, right? If you have context for building a drug, you don't necessarily have context for building a consumer company. It's actually been a challenge for me. It's kind of building up that muscle because I am like most bio people insofar that I've never thought about things like marketing before. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was loyal is like, can we run these clinical studies and actually make it a really positive experience? I think that people really want to be involved in um, because they, uh, because we introduced the idea uh, of, you know, community science in a way that's, um, amenable to the average dog owner. Um, and so there's like functional ways of doing this by like having cute swag, right? Like have we give the dogs bandanas? I'm sure you've seen the pictures of Wolfie and the bandana, yeah. but also things like we did a collaboration with Mudville, which is a senior dog rescue in SF and did a site there where the dogs came. Um, and just like testing out little ideas of that, like how to reassess, how to do a clinical study. I love that. I, how, how does this fit into what's happening right now, just in general within the pharmaceutical space and how, you know, the general distrust that, um, we're facing in the industry? Yeah. So it's interesting. I think, mm, I mean, obviously COVID has been both really good for this and really bad for this. Moderna and Pfizer have made, uh, vaccines and like the I, like people cognizant of how a drug gets approved. Nobody ever thought about FDA timelines before, right? If you weren't in the industry. So that's been really great. Um, and kind of seeing this startup quote unquote biotech company build what is seems to be like generally considered one of the most robust vaccines that we have against COVID. So that's been super positive. Um, we've also have seen this distrust and this like uh, this uh, lack of like ability to communicate well. And there's like the scientific communication not translating well into general public communication, uh, in part because there hasn't been a demand or a pattern or a self accountability to transparency in this industry because they didn't need to, right? Because the only people that were really paying attention were people who had acute diseases, not the entirety of the world, basically, because now that you have an indication that's relevant to the entire world in terms of needing COVID vaccination. Um, so it, I'm, I'm thankful how, for how aware COVID has made the average person of how a drug gets developed, but it is unfortunate that it has fostered this distrust and it was avoidable, but predictable, again, given how uh, paternalistic scientific communication often can be and how uh, and 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 con uh, convoluted, mm -hmm. and how badly it's predictable that people would react to that. <laughs> Absolutely, um, you mentioned I think on on your website um, with regards to the clinical study you guys did, um, it involved what I think the term was mobile pop up sites. So we did these pop up sites. This was actually what I was talking about was Mudville. So, so traditionally, a clinical trial in veterinary medicine is run um, at veterinarian clinics that specialize in this. It's, you know, a revenue stream for them. They get paid to participate in clinical studies. These are often in rural cities because you make a lot more, much more money off of a pet coming in for um, whatever it needs. 
than you do for uh, hosting a clinical study. And it's like pretty laborious. Also, and there isn't always this culture, generally speaking, of participating in clinical studies in the veterinarian space. Um, however, that causes an issue because the, the our target market and a lot of people who are aware of Loyal want to participate in what we're doing are in major metros, uh, but we weren't able to have sites there. So uh, we were exploring ways to basically bring sites to pet parents. So we had mobile vans that we enrolled in the study. We did these pop-up clinics for a few days a week at things like Mudville. And we're actually working now on potentially facilitating our, um, our office to be a pop-up site um, for licensed veterinarians to work out of so that we're able to be um, open at times that are convenient for dog owners. That's awesome. I love that concept. Is, I mean, my first thought though, when we think about translating this to humans is that we wouldn't necessarily be able to utilize any of those learnings, but I'd, I'd love to hear if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, so I haven't run a, cl a, a human clinical study yet, so I um, will have to give an asterisk on the regulatory aspect, but I do think the idea of making clinical studies uh, more accessible, more comprehensible to the average person, um, and something that any somebody in any location can access, it will clearly should parse over. And also the broader idea, again, that we're just introducing this idea, right, that there are drugs that we test, um, that this is the process for a drug getting approved, and if you make it a fun experience, like make it something fun and interesting and sexy uh, is a great way to get people interested in self-educating themselves, which is something that we hopefully can do with things like the Mudville pop-up. Nice. And as far as the drug target goes, what was that selection process like? Did you already have IP around this when you started the company? No, so Loyal thing that I would call a thesis first company. So I had some ideas for what we were going to do that ended up being incorrect once I hired a scientific team, which, which has much more scientific experience than I do. Uh, it became clear that they weren't viable drug products, which is totally fine. The basic thesis of Loyal is that there is something, there is a pharmaceutical product out there that inevitably uh, extends dog lifespan and health span safely and also has the uh, variables to be a viable consumer product. Um, from like a COGS perspective and whatnot, a manufacturing perspective. And so the job of Loyal is to find that drug and bring it to market successfully. We're really non-dogmatic. We're not emotionally attached to any specific mechanism. It's really just about what will work safely and what can we prove works safely quickly. Um, and that kind of um, unemotional attachment to a specific scientific thesis, I think is something that's allowed us to move really quickly and also allowed us to execute excellently because we're not trying to prove ourselves we're not trying to like prove something that we um, we don't may or may not know is true, and we're not going to fail if we show that something is wrong because we don't we don't care if a specific drug fails. We care if we don't execute on finding what will succeed, if that makes sense, right? And so we're not really a specific drug company. Um, and really, if we execute well, the like mode of failure for loyal is just not. It, it, it's you know. If maybe there is nothing that extends dog lifespan, that's also a viable product. Like, I think that's highly, highly unlikely, right? So we really are actually core de-risk from a technical standpoint. And it really just comes down to execution, which is still incredibly difficult. Like, do not get me wrong. That is it's so super duper hard, but at least we are able to de-risk that existential variable um, in addition. Absolutely. Getting into your scientific team, your website says that you rely heavily on CROs to conduct some of your mm -hmm. scientific experiments. Can you talk about that model and is that still the case or have you built out more of an internal team? Yeah, so this is, um, is this something that we've done that's actually pretty common in biotech uh, that I really recommend if you're able to do it yourself. So CROs are contract research organizations, they don't do that. They, Asterisk, they can work on you with it, but generally speaking, they don't do the intellectual work. You design the protocol, you, and we have scientists in house who do that, but they do it on a laptop. And then you get the work done explicitly at the CRO. And there's a lot of advantages of this. It means, again, you're not buying into doing a certain technology because they have the internal, uh, you don't have to build out the machinery um, or invest in anything really. You can do a quick experiment, test a quick methodology, and not be bought into it financially. Um, it, and you often have people who are specialized in the thing that you are trying to do. 
so for example there's some you know aging models that we are working on and yeah like we could bring those in house but people who are running those models have run tens to hundreds of studies on these models right and we would have run them for the first time ourselves if we brought it in plus all the operational challenges of bring it in it's just like adds all this risk that's completely unnecessary and of course there is an increased cost to doing it was a CRO but I think if you actually just like if you negate the fact that inevitably there would have been at least one fail if we did something in-house uh then the the, the the capital ends up being not very uh uh differential um the other thing about building a lab in-house it's very difficult right now the market for uh laboratory scientists is tough it's tough 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 uh, building out a lab is expensive. It takes a really long time. And so there are companies where you're not going to be able to avoid this if your core technology, if your core platform is something in the lab. Uh, but we were able to avoid it. And I think we've saved ourselves a lot of burn uh, by doing this. Do you utilize any um, SRAs as in addition to the CROs? Sorry, research associates? Um, sorry, like... Uh scientific while wow, i'm blanking on what it stands for but basically working with like a lab or university to conduct a research study oh sometimes we're, we're doing more collaborations now uh the main reason not to is often a time is really long this is they work at a slower time scale mm -hmm. uh, and there can be ip issues sure makes sense i just know some people kind of mix mix and match with those two approaches and and i think it's interesting that you're focused on the the CRO um, usage. I think that's a neat model. Yeah, well, I think people just do that because it, it's cheaper to do as academia. You often have relationships, people come out of academia, they understand how it works. Um, and if you're doing something really novel, it can be beneficial, right? Like CROs aren't great for um, a totally novel methodology. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is really challenging in terms of the uh, logistical and time issues. Yeah, and I guess I think where the SRA approach is valuable is for some some groups, you know, um, they might have a specific mouse model or, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of uh, advantage there. Um, getting back to like these cultural differences you kind of touched on um, with running a dog focused biotech, are there, I mean, do you gravitate towards um, interacting with people at other uh, dog, therapeutic biotech companies like rejuvenate or what's your like what's your peer group kind of like at your level ah that's interesting um i would say my peer group is mostly other founders who are mostly actually in the tech space uh we really think more like a a tech company in many ways than we think like a biotech company uh and we also operate more like a tech company in many ways than we do a biotech company um and I, we don't have any explicit collaborations with other aging companies but it's not like necessarily like a cool thing of the aging field is it's actually very mutually supportive if one of us makes it it increases the probability of all of us making it you know if one of us fails it hurts the probability of all of us making it um but we we haven't really done that many collaborations with companies like rejuvenate honestly because we just don't have time <laughs> we're busy enough with kind of all our own pipeline products that makes sense are there any companies out there outside of loyal that that you kind of have your eye on and think are doing interesting things in this space yeah i think bioage is a really really well run uh good solid thesis aging company uh, so my kristen fortney they're basically looking at um, paired mouse and human omics to identify ver uh, viable targets. And then in licensing, you know, drugs that have completed phase one to phase two clinical studies and perhaps been abandoned for reasons that don't have to do with safety or don't have to do with efficacy as relevant to aging, in license them and in developing them for proxy indications that they think are relevant to aging. So things like frailty and immune aging. Um, they're really smart um, and they've really done a good job of executing efficiently and effectively on bringing aging, potential aging drugs into the clinic. Uh, Spring Discovery just announced a raise. They're doing phenotypic based um, uh, ML small molecule screens, or I don't actually know if it's only small molecules, but screens for drugs that um, are based off of the phenotypic response 
to the drug. So instead of saying like, oh, we think that this, you know, mechanism is it, it's like agnostic, like who cares what the mechanism? It's more of like, at least at first pass, it's more of like, do you rescue the cellular phenotype from the aged, um, the age degeneration process? And Ben Kamins is an amazing, amazing CEO and a great, great operator. Um, when you say phenotype yeah. response, then is that in vitro or in vivo? As far as I know, um, again, they've probably progressed a lot since I last looked at a deck for them, um, yeah. but at least in vitro. Neat. Um, getting back to Loyal, you guys just completed your Series A fundraising. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how this round compared to your seed round and what the process was like, how much of your time you were uh, working on this and kind of just the general process? Yeah, so we raised $27 million. Coastal was our lead investor, Alex Morgan. Um, coming in, I knew we needed to find a technical investor that believed in founder first companies, uh, which is a hard test in Silicon Valley. Uh, we've had a lot of kind of more consumer and traditional tech investors today. It was the obvious exception being Laura. Um, but that actually, that it has been a huge boon to me in the, the, the like areas, again, like I was talking about before, uh, consumer doesn't come as naturally to me as, the, you know, building an R&D team does. So having investors with that specialty is incredibly helpful to the company. But the other like variable that we really need to compensate for is the fact that the majority of people cannot diligence loyal. And so if we want to unlock other swaths of capital and in bio, there's a pretty direct relationship between the amount of money you raise um, and your probability of success, assuming you execute well. Uh, we, I knew we need to have somebody on the cap table um, who could speak to the science and the scientific rigor of what we're building. Uh, and be that proxy for anybody else who wants to come in. Um, and so I ended up going with Alex and Vinod because the other challenge that I found, so obviously our thesis developed dog aging drugs. We also want to use those learnings to uh, eventually pan into human aging drugs. I really want to build the aging pharma company, the SpaceX of aging, the Moderna of aging, uh, really kind of help catalyze this field. And what happened when I was out racing is a lot of people believed in one thesis and not the other. So they believe in dog aging drugs, that it's a billion dollar market. They wanted me to focus on building that company or they believed in the human aging drugs, obviously, and wanted me to build there, but really didn't have comprehension for the dog thesis. Um, and that was really frustrating because that, uh, I, I feel strongly that the companies are interdependent on each other. I don't think you can build, in my opinion, or would be more challenging to build the human aging company without the dog step first. And equally, I'm committed to building an animal pharma company, A, because it's a valid and you know venture scale business to build, uh, but also because it'll get us over to the human work in a way that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, and Alex and Vinod got both. And that was really rare and really important to me. And I really didn't want to deal with the pressure of being, basically pressure into being a human first company and failing in the ways that I was talking about earlier that I'd seen all these other aging companies struggle and fail with. Um, as far as the process, I mean, raising a Series A is a tough job. Um, it went well, it went smoothly. We'd executed really, really excellently. I built out a team um, that is, you know, really, uh, <laughs> really good to, to be like totally candid. But it is a hard process because really in the Series A, you're pitching what you'll hit for the Series B. Um, and that just for me personally, I had a lot of experience with seed and Series A companies. I have not had as much experience with later stage companies to date. Um, so that was a lot of learning of like, how do I tell a story in a field that people don't understand very well about what we're going to be able to do with this money to create an inflection point in value and prove that we're going to be a billion dollar company. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's an exhaustive process, and it doesn't end after you close the round. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, and as far as the size of the round, was it what you wanted? Or um, I know a lot of companies are experiencing like oversubscribed rounds. Yeah, I mean we oversubscribed. Uh, the term sheet was for twenty five. We took twenty seven. Um, we could have taken more if we wanted to. Um, yeah, it's a balance, right? You don't want to over dilute. That's disrespectful to your employees. It's also um, just not necessary a lot of the time. 
Yeah. Equally, you want to raise enough that if something does go wrong, well, A, you can hit your milestones, but B, if something goes wrong, you don't have a false fail. I think false fails are a huge risk for anything technically difficult. You know, your first thing you does happens to fail. There's no weird way you could have predicted, but then you don't have enough money to do the second thing. And it's very difficult for investors to tease out or anybody really to tease out if the reason why you failed was a true false fail that was unavoidable or if it's an execution error, right? And they don't necessarily want to put more money into a company that's having execution errors. Um, but yeah, so we landed on a 25 because I felt like that allowed us to get to significant inflection points with our drugs in a way um, uh, and give us some buffer to do some of the extracurricular work that we're doing too because there's such a huge white space in aging and we want to tackle as much of it as possible without getting distracted, of course. What do you mean by there being a huge white space in aging? There's like, what, four translational aging companies, five, like there aren't that many that are actually bringing aging drugs into the clinic. Um, there's a lot of early stage preclinical aging companies, mm-hmm. um, but because there's this dearth of translation so far in this field, um, I and many other people feel strongly that there's an opportunity to kind of land grab around what areas of aging you're working on and also bringing in and training some of the best talent in the field. Uh, these are both expensive things. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you hear about the announcement of, I think the company's name is Altos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts around that company? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad more money is going to the aging space. That's always positive. Um, I do think, I worry from a couple of avenues. One, it's it, I always find it really funny that these people who built companies in a very tech way, right? So they weren't, they never would have been, you know, a, a traditional CEO. They kind of started early. They showed that they were competent regardless of their background um, or experience level, built something amazing, made lots and lots of money, and then go and hire the exact opposite model of who they are, which is like the incumbents who have been in the field, who have like not executed on building the first aging drug. <laughs> um, and in some cases have like explicitly failed on that. Um, and put them at the top to run things like this. Um, I'm sure they'll like discover a lot of amazing work, but it's kind of, um, I think we need some fresh blood in the aging field. And look, I'm not saying me, (laughs) like I'm very happy and loyal, but there, uh, I think there would have been, I think there would have been a non-consensus, a contrarian take to put somebody new at the head of this and maybe it would have failed or maybe it would have been a lot more successful than it's going, than it might be. I think Calico is a really good example of this, right? Like Calico has just become, Calico has so much progress and promise and it has made progress, but it's also really just become a pharma company inside of a tech company. And it's just like sad to see this hoovering up of money and resources and talent, and then basically building academia inside of what is supposed to be one of the most transformational and ambitious and fast moving tech companies there is. And it's because they, I mean, it's not because, but I would say like a driving factor was who they decided on the leadership for this and that they brought the old models back and expected the old models to do something other than what they did. Like people always tell you to do what they did themselves. I was somebody who's asking me for career advice last night. I basically told them to do what I did. (laughs) Um, And it's inevitable. It's a trap I'm going to fall into too. And when I'm in, you know, when I'm older, like they should maybe not give me money. Maybe they should go and fund the next, you know, 20 something year old ambitious person who is going to have frameworks that I've never thought of. It's the cycle. Um, so that's just a long way of saying that glad there's more money going to the aging field, definitely a net positive. I think there's more that could be done. Um, and I really hope they don't fall into the same traps that all these other mega funded aging conglomerates have. Or even mega funded biotech or yeah. immunopharma. <laughs> yeah. I definitely, um, could speak more to that, but, um, Getting into this uh, cycle idea, generational idea of, of companies, um, I was curious um, with the trial of Elizabeth Holmes going on right now, it's something I've been following closely. I just have kind of a obsession with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if you think at all about the impact, positive or negative, that Theranos has had on this industry. Super negative. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, it's really frustrating, honestly. Um, I get the Theranos thing all the time. I get asked on the next Elizabeth Holmes 
Um, and like, there's this like subtle, yeah. And like, there's just like subtle Which fear annoys that they me have, a lot, but anyway, it's so. super sexist. It's exceedingly sexist. Like there are a ton of male founders who have flamed out, who have done fraud, but because it's a woman and it's shocking and it's a, you know, she's young and hot and whatever that it just becomes like the prototypical image of what somebody thinks of when you're thinking of a young female biotech founder. Same thing as you buy them, right? Like there was a male co-founder, but who do we think of, right? You think of the female co-founder and she's the one who's was on the image of all of the, the news articles about what happened. Um, and if you even talk to, I mean, I don't have any insider knowledge, but it, just talking to former employees, like the, the consensus was actually, it was, um, and I'm, I'm blanking on their names, but it was the male co-founder who drove a lot of this. Yeah. Um, and she just, I mean, she's still, you know, if she participated, it's still a crime. I'm not excusing her, but it, it's just, it's frustrating how it's always the woman who gets nailed on these things. Um, so yeah, it's been a total negative. Wish it hadn't happened. Here we are. And if anybody calls me, if anybody makes Elizabeth Holmes joke to my face, like, don't do it. It's really it's number one. It's the number one way to make me hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agreed. I'm like, just because I have blonde hair, you don't have to bring this up. Um, yeah. And can you talk, I, cause I heard you talk about this, like pattern matching a lot. And I, I'd love for you to elaborate, like what you mean by that, like dive into that a little bit more. Um, and just how that relates to like each generation of, um, founders over time. Yeah. So, I mean, so I guess the, the, to give quick context, it's VCs fund huge swaths of ideas. Um, the way their portfolios work, depending on the stage of the investors, you don't really expect the, um, most companies you invest in, at least in the early stage will fail. And they'll also change a lot from zero to one. Right. And so it's really more honestly, like a good seed investor bets on a general thesis and a founder and to realize that everything else will be figured out from there. Um, but it's also difficult to figure out if somebody's a good founder. Um, it's, there's a lot of, I mean, I, I think about it a lot actually, because there's so many niche decisions that we have made that there's no way somebody could diligence that. But if I had not made the decision in the way in which I did, we might've been dead or not done as well. Um, like for example, we started as gene therapy and then very quickly moved over to what we're doing now. Um, and that like flexibility, despite like my, you know, you know, many year experience in gene therapy and personal bias for gene therapy is something that nobody knew going in. I was going to have to do that, but that trait was super important because if I had not done that, Loyal would definitely be dead by now. Right. Or maybe it'd be, be like struggling along, but it wouldn't be like a six, it wouldn't, the probability of success would have been significantly lower. It's so, like that cognitive flexibility is a hard thing to assess for. So what often happens is VCs just like, uh, purposely or unpurposely pattern match to what those traits have expressed themselves in founders that are now successful. So where the feedback loop has been completed. Uh, the problem is that the previous generation of founders is largely young, white, rich, Stanford educated males um, who talk in a certain way, communicate in a certain way, um, who come from a certain background, who have a certain cultural context. And if you don't come from that background, you're not going to fit that pattern, right? And I bring up the pattern because a lot of people just yell about it and they're like, wow, VCs are evil, like sexist pigs because they don't, you know, it's not that. It's natural that you pattern match. And if you are hiring people, you are also pattern matching to what competency does and doesn't look like because realistically you just can't get that full in information scope in a hiring process no matter how hard you try. Like you're not gonna change a fundamental aspect of how people interact. What you can change, well, what you can do is one, understand the pattern, two, understand how to fit the pattern in the ways that are necessary, understand three, where to deviate from the pattern, uh, and understand four, how to change the pattern, right? So a lot of what I've done is understand the pattern. Uh, I literally listened to every single Y Combinator podcast when I first came to the Valley because Y Combinator has been one of the uh, predominant forces in uh, molding what the pattern of excellence looks like today. Um, and then as I have had more objective validation of my competency, 
I have shifted further and further away from what is the uh, abstained, accepted, check blue check mark pattern to what's the Celine pattern, right? And I still, you know, borrow somewhat from the YC playbook. I and then I also have my own things that I do myself because it's just who I am, and that's important because if I, we are successful, if loyal is successful. The next pattern is going to be partially influenced by me. And that's how you get that progressive change, right? So you have to get to the success point if you want to change a pattern and screaming about it ain't going to do anything, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Love that. Um, so now that um, your recent funding round is closed, um, do you have more time or energy to focus on other aspects of your company? And, and what are you excited to be um, having more time for. <laughs> Sorry, you, you've caught me in like probably the busiest week of my year so far. So the idea of having time to do anything is comical to me, um, but I do want to focus more. So we're scaling right now. We're like mid thirties. Everything is breaking, which is normal. This is like very like car launch startup. You hit high twenties, early thirties. Everything that worked before doesn't work anymore. It's an annoying problem, mostly because it annoys the team. Um, so that gives like a huge urgency to fixing it. At a meta level, it's actually really interesting, like this organizational theory and how to have an organization run properly. Uh, so I don't actually mind that much working on it, but you know, that's what I want to focus on predominantly. Uh, if and when <laughs> I find time to do that and sleep. <laughs> how would you describe your leadership style and your management style? I think it's, um, I mean, I feel like it's a better question for the team. Uh, I don't, I don't know if, and like a toxic leader would say, yeah, my style is toxicity. <laughs> um, so with that asterisk, um, I try to hire people who I'm intimidated by in terms of their competence and intelligence, who are better than me in the vertices that are relevant to building an aging pharma company, and then empower them with context and ambition and first principles thinking to tackle this problem, right? To give them the space and the resources and the time to work on this problem wholly. Uh, I very rarely pull the CEO card. <laughs> I pull it sometimes when I think things are non-intuitive um, or, you know, helpful in the long term, even if painful in the short term. But it's actually a lot of, most decisions are delegated um, slash, uh, held by the person who has the most competence in whatever that variable is. Uh, I think that's the biggest one. I also just try to be really transparent. I try to not be an asshole. I try to not be, um, the, the hierarchy makes me really uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to have it in a company. I, there's like a Silicon Valley trend of like not having it. I don't think that works, but I, it's, it's not like, the like organization of the team, trying to separate that as much as possible from the competency of the team, if that makes sense. Because it's not really about that. It's just about how do we organize, how we do things, and then equally, you know, who's the best person to do that. So the most junior person, quote unquote, should and can and has like given me feedback, give feedback on an idea, say that's why it's not a good idea. And that's really important because you lose that. And that's like actually a, an artifact of academic culture where hierarchy is so important. So you have to bind to the structure. You're going to actually have any worth in a PhD or a postdoc um, or an associate professorship or whatever it is. Uh, cracking that and getting that kind of out of people's heads is something that I've spent a lot of time on um, and has uh, is a process, but it's something that I think allows for better work. Yeah, I love, I, I got the sense just based on your website and some of the communications um, that transparency is really important to you. And I'm curious, like, how that came about. Was it a response to these academic hierarchical environments that you'd been in previously? Yeah. Or were there any other people, you know, in your industry that you kind of learned um, that skill from? So I didn't learn it from anybody. Uh, it was a part, couple of things. Um, we struggled with it at Longevity Fund because Longevity Fund for a very long time was just Laura. Um, so there wasn't, transparency is not something that where you have an ideology for it and then it happens. It actually takes a ton of work to be transparent, which is another thing I've learned, right? Like we have been un unintentionally op uh, uh, opaque and loyal recently. And it wasn't because I wanted to be, it was because 
uh, basically the amount of like weights that we were lifting to make transparency occur at like 15 to 20 people was totally insufficient, insufficient for doing it now. Um, but I learned as an employee of the fund how important that was to being able to execute well, but also just like a mutual respect of the person. Uh, and then also because I really, really, really strongly dislike that some of the toxic aspects of some forms, and I, again, I went to a very, very conservative university, right? Like Oxford is one of the most conservative universities there is. And I really bristled against the paternalism that is built into institutions like that. It just was disrespectful in my opinion. And also again, not in service of finding like scientific truth as effectively as possible. Uh, so I knew coming in, if we wanted to hire the best people and retain the best people and do the best science and serve this thesis that we're working on, that we had to have certain va values and variables well, um, well aligned. I love that. Can you, cause, um, I'm noticing a trend in the biotech startup space right now yeah. where companies really want to borrow what I think came out of the tech industry, um, this idea of being in stealth mode um, for a period mm -hmm. of time. Can you comment on that trend? And like, do you think stealth mode is important for companies or in, in the biotech space in particular? I think it depends. Um, I don't know if I have a super strong opinion on this, the, we didn't do it. Um, I've always had a re relatively like public persona about loyal. It's been really helpful for hiring and building. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to join a startup. And if you can get any contacts, some people are working on or who the, you know, leaders are and how they think it's very hard to hide who you are when you're being public over a period of time. Like you do, you just do slip up if you're not, if you're faking it. Um, so I think it's been positive. I think the other thing I've learned is the execution is so difficult. Like I would have like panicked if it leaked what our drugs were before. Now I'm like, huh, like I mean, we still can't leak. It's still confidential. But if it did, like good, good fucking luck, right? Yeah. Like good luck copying what we're doing. Like we've tackled some hairy ass, sorry. We have <laughs> tackled some very hairy technical diff uh, difficulties and technical challenges and it, it, that's a huge moat. Um, and so I, I don't know if the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. I guess the caveat would be though, it's, you know, how competitive is the field and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I think it just depends on the situation. Absolutely. Um, getting into kind of the, what it personally takes to, to found and run a company. Can you talk about what that looks like and how you make yeah. time for yourself? <laughs> it's I feel I felt strongly this way before and this is only increased with um loyal growing you should only build a company if there's like if you just cannot stand the idea of this thing not being in the world and there's nothing else you would work on and there's no other way you'd work on it in my opinion building a company to build a company is a really stupid idea because it's short-term terrible <laughs> Uh, and it's not because I'm not having fun. I love my team. I love what we're doing. I love my days, but it is just like a, it's like you're training for a sport, right? Like nobody's like, oh yeah, like the pain. Yeah. Like I'm having so much fun while I do like my hundredth rep of push-ups or whatever. No, like it hurts. It's terrible. Uh, it's the, like the, the, the result that's the driver and you have to care deeply and want that result to be in the world to go through it. Um, also when you're building a company, I mean, this might be more of a me thing because this is the biggest company I've ever worked at. It's been the biggest company I've ever worked at since approximately, you know, three people. Uh, you just have to change and you, you mess up. Even if what you're doing was correct six months ago, can become incorrect with scale, incorrect in the, in the current situation. You didn't have to feel really terrible about what you did was wrong because you care and you care about your team and you care about your field and you care about being a competent leader. And you're like, damn it, I messed it up. And then you have to get over it and you have to get past it and reassess it and go do the next thing, right? And it's over and over and over and over and over again, you're remaking yourself. And if you ever stop remaking yourself, that's the recipe for basically not scaling with your company. And again, great in the long term. I am so satisfied looking at my personal growth over the last two years. Terrible in the short term. <laughs> it is so terrible in the short term. Um, 
so I mean, I mean, the, the like traditional thing that people say is like it's like eating glass, and it is. And if you're willing to eat glass to get longevity drugs, like you should do it. If you're not willing to eat glass, like don't do it, dude. Like there's better ways to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm on my second biotech startup now, so I can relate to that. Yeah. Oh, so one of the things I really love about your your website is that you have these um, essays that you share. Yeah. And I was just curious. I mean, it's very much in like the Paul Graham style. So I was curious if that was inspiration at all or, um, you know, how writing plays into your life and and um, your work. Yeah. So writing has been probably the most helpful thing I've ever done uh, personally and professionally. It's uh, able to be ascribed to every inflection point that I've had. And I really recommend if you don't know how to write well, learning how to write well. Uh, so the, I, I definitely am inspired by PG essays. I think the fact that they've, uh, themselves, I, so just for context, I never found the PG essays until long after I was kind of into Silicon Valley. I, it really was, just, was not drinking from the Silicon Valley culture fire hose until it was basically forced upon me. Um, however, though, the fact that he has activated so many people to a different way of thinking across the world with writing is something that I aspire to impact a, a portion of a portion of the people that he has over time. Um, he's, he's obviously like a controversial figure in some ways, but I, uh, it's, I think it's pretty objective to say that his, his impact has been more positive than negative in many, many ways. Um, so that's a big one. I think also the P. Marka uh, startup archives were something that really inspired me. I read those a lot when I first got started. Um, and just in general, like the people who take the time to try to educate while they're doing things, uh, are all the only reason that I have a career. And I think it's just, you have to, if you care about the field, you have to give back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are you involved in any kind of mentorship activities outside of? I mean, I support other earlier stage founders. I'd like to do more. We do weekly or monthly aging seminars, which are largely to expose people to the field. Uh, that have been really helpful. Nice. Uh, I would like to do, it's, it all comes down to time. I get, it, that's like a really tough thing. Is you get so many advice asks at this stage yeah. and it's only going to get worse. Um, and you want to say yes to everything, but then you're not doing anything for your team because you're helping somebody else. And mm -hmm. so, um, when somebody figures out cloning, I'll be able to help even more. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, like how many hours a day do you usually work? Um, a lot like most of them <laughs> wow I mean I'm not saying that's like to be clear I'm not saying that's like the optimal way to function but it is the way that I am functioning right now mm -hmm. um one last question I think um so you talked at the beginning about how you took this leap of faith to work with Laura because you realized you would be able to learn faster in that environment um, and, yeah. you know, learning quickly is one of your, um, philosophies, um, looking back, you know, is there any advice you would give yourself, um, a few years yeah. back? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I did this. So again, to go back to the point that everyone gives advice of what they already did. Uh, I think the thing that I did is like, I always found a room where I was the least competent, the least intelligent, the least accomplished. Uh, and that really helped. Right. So I went to UT. Uh, I, at that stage was not great at many things and I was able to learn a lot from there, but I didn't go too far, right? Like I think I'd be gone from high school to Harvard. It would have actually been quite bad. Um, the stepping stones really helped. Uh, I then went and excelled in this, uh, undergrad, uh, internship program that I was in. I then went to Oxford and was again, like not as competent of them and grew a lot. And then came to Silicon Valley where I was total like bottom 10%, probably like lower, um, and dealt with the pain of that. But then again, that like really enforced like a, like learning quickly, but also just like being okay with that. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to do now is surround myself with more founders who I think are way better than I am. Um, and people who are better thinkers than I am to really kind of hit that next scale. And it, the thing is like, it gets really easy to stop doing that. Like I could probably get away with not doing that now. Um, maybe in the short term, short to medium term, but it's really important for hitting your personal maximum potential, which is uh, a meta goal of mine. 
I love that. Um, is there anything else you want to touch on, you know, loyal or otherwise? Um, anything that we should link for um, the viewers? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to obviously link any of my writings. I think the important thing is just like understanding which hills you want to die on and kind of building your career around that. For me, it's really around building an aging drug. It's around setting an example for younger and female founders in the bio space. Uh, and it's less around other things, right? And just, you know, figuring out what battles you care about, what battles you don't care about, being really explicit about that uh, is something that I think has really helped to me be effective uh, preliminarily and initially on those things in the field. Awesome. Great advice. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for taking the time today, Celine. I know you're really busy and I'm <laughs> just, I'm no, of course. so excited about what Loyal's done so far. I just love, you know, love the thesis and I'm just, I'll be watching to see what happens next for you guys. And um, congrats again on the Series A. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for creating this. I think it's, um, that like activation point is really difficult. Like where do you figure out who to trust first? Um, and so, I mean, I don't know, maybe I, I, yeah, I guess, I guess you probably trust me at least a little bit, but uh, in general, just like kind of getting, giving people a context for like how this world works and how people think in this world. Um, at least for me, somebody who came totally ex externally from it, it's uh, you're, you're helping a lot of people with that. So thanks for, Thanks for doing all the labor behind this. I'm happy to just sit here and answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I I agree. Like I just I want to break down barriers and I think sharing stories like yours with people just helps them see for themselves what they're capable of and um how to put the pieces together and um I I just think the space right now is really exciting. Like there's uh you know, a lot more female founders in the biotech community. And um, the interview I just did a couple of weeks ago with Lindsay Pino is kind of in the same vein. And yeah, um, yeah, I'm excited right now for what's going on in the space. So yeah, it's been good. Cool. Next, we need like a totally, you know, female VC. Well, in addition to Laura's, <laughs> but um, oh, we do we totally do. But it's I think you need to have female founders first for that. Yeah. Right. Or otherwise they're just always going to be junior associate principal, whatever. Um, just need a bunch of badass women who build billion dollar companies. So we need some guys who are willing to make the bridge, which thankfully I have quite a few of them on my cap table. Uh, but there, there could always be more. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. Thank you. Bye. Ariana. Thank you. What? I had a great interview. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun writing the questions for this one. And I think everybody will learn a lot from Celine. I'm excited to share it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank, right, you. thank you. Bye. Bye. That wraps up my interview with Celine Hollywa. Celine, thank you so much for taking the time today and sharing your insights and experiences with all of us. I learned so much. If you've enjoyed this content, please check out the interview I did with Lindsay Pino or the interview I did with Christina Trojal Hansen, both also female founders in the biotech space. Lots to learn from these wonderful ladies. And thank you so much for supporting the podcast.